Yo, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you're welcome to this inaugural webinar series. Um, it's inaugural because um, this is the first of its kind and the first in the series of several webinars that we're going to be having. We are going to be getting a talk from um, Samuel Naderon on digitally gated community surveillance after NSAS protest. Yeah, so um, a little bit about uh, BOCOS that we know is that BOCOS is the headquarters of um, BOCOS local government area in Plateau State. Um, Plateau State has about 17 local governments and BOCOS is, uh, look, is uh, BOCOS is local government and um, the university is actually located in BOCOS. It has an area of about 1,682 kilometers um, and a population of about 178,000. There are three major languages in um, Bokos. You have the Ron, the Mushere, and the Kuleri. Bokos is Hello? majorly. Bokos is majorly and. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. It's an agricultural community. Um, Hi, everybody. Can have, you hear me? We have majorly. Um, Few things Irish potato in Nigeria about it consumes about forty five percent of the total Irish potato consumed in Nigeria. So um, can we, we just have to meet with the presenter? Yep. So we uh, before us today um, is um, Samuel Olaron. Samuel Olaron will be our presenter for today. Samuel Olaron is a PhD candidate at the University of. Vitz Waters, uh, Waters Strand, a lecturer in the Department of MassCom, Plateau State University. His research, his research creativity, uh, creativity connects with some of the most innovative approaches towards on the spread and use of social media at the time to produce much needed, much um, at the same time to produce much needed original knowledge on Africa. It touches on normative assumptions that have often clouded the study of, of the media in Africa, often interpreted as a tool for development or emancipation, rather than more humbly exploring the myriad ways in which old and new media are shaped and reshaped, reinvented even in different social political contexts. The study narrows in on the disinformation campaign targeting electoral contests in Nigeria to illustrate how Twitter networks and coordinated inauthentic behaviors connected to the provision of false or misleading information, information do not represent a deviant, deviant use of internet, but an interesting, interesting part of it. Now, you will believe with me that um, this study, this presentation is apt, especially at this time when the federal government uh, had just banned Twitter and also trying to uh, force all new media to register with CAC. So this, uh, uh, I hope you are going to enjoy this time with us. So at this time, I would ask um, Sam Olaron to take the stage. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's, it's nice to, to see my colleagues at the long time. Um, my presentation um, is on digitally gated community surveillance after NSAS protest. Um, we recall that last year, uh, precisely October 8, 2020, we had the NSAS protest starting and it spanned through October 20th, which was the climax of the protest, as I'll call it, with what we have now come to know as the Meki massacre. Um, gated community is concerned with potentially coercive use of control against specific people or groups on a political or other basis. Although digitalization could broaden democratic engagement, government and large corporations 
are increasingly using digital environments to monitor and direct citizens. Um, the NSAS protests revealed the unprecedented scope and magnitude of state surveillance of our everyday digital activities in pursuit of commodification or desertification of social life. Humanity has entered a period of living in a digital surveillance economy. Living in a digital surveillance economy where the acquisition and exploitation of large amounts of personal data through digital devices are used by governments around the world for security purposes to either discipline or care for citizens. Uh, the pervasive adoption of social media has dramatically increased the power of states to carry out digital surveillance and even abuse personal online data. And we've seen these play across um, many countries around the world. Uh, digital, digital surveillance by the nation state has been justified by the argument that such surveillance by the argument that such surveillance can protect people by preventing illegal and dangerous activities, thereby contributing to safety, security, and autonomy in society. However, uh, governments across the world, and, and of course in Nigeria, have come under sharp criticism for their use of digital surveillance technologies to gather massive amounts of personal information Yet, with little evidence of this mass surveillance being effective in improving security of users of digital tools, we are now witnessing what we call we are now witnessing what we call a new era of political control that uses uh, sophisticated tools of mass surveillance to quickly collect information and map users' relationships. These kind of deployment of, of um, algorithms allow governments to assign meaning to social media posts, identify new categories of patterns, infer past relationships, determine uh, location of, of users, and as well build a, a kind of community understanding of what kind of groups and uh, preferences users have online. Um, surveillance in itself, is not bad, but when you have a focused attention to persons or groups with a view to influencing, managing or controlling them has never been, been seen to, to be innocent. We want to cast our minds back to um, uh, elections around the world, even, even in Nigeria, uh, particularly I'll make reference to the Cambridge Analytica um, influence operation in Nigeria, where they tried to collect um, user data and sell to to politicians, and you know we 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 can we will see later in my presentation how uh, the government, in an attempt to or rather pretending to be protective of its citizens, is collecting information that is used for sinister purposes. Now, the NSAS protest was majorly a protest that was carried out. Um, in reaction to rampant police uh, brutality and harassment, illegal detentions and other issues. And, you know, this has affected civil rights, privacy and basic freedoms in Nigeria, where people are being harassed on a daily basis by um, special and robbery squad officers, uh, which we know as SAS. Um, they search your phones, they search your laptops without any legal warrant. And all of these, they say, is an attempt to rid the society of, of cyber crime or cyber bullying or, or any other form of, of crime that is perpetrated online. And one other argument they made is that they are trying to clean up the social media space in Nigeria. But what we see is unfortunately an attempt to regulate social media and internet uh, in the name of national security. Um, my, my, my research is tailored to examine Nigerian government's use of Twitter as a tool to enforce digitally gated community. Um, I'm also 
interested in contributing to evolving conversations on the potential for digital surveillance to become a class weapon, centrally controlled and coordinated system designed into the flows of everyday existence of social media users in sub-Saharan Africa. And more, more recently, we'll see how government, um, unfortunately today again, we are having another protest in Nigeria. Government is trying to relate social movements to existing political polarization in Nigeria. And for them to be able to do that, they need to um, collect information about users online and then appropriate those information for political ends, as I've said earlier. Uh, now, in, in this research, I am working with um, over 12 million tweets mined from Twitter's API. Um, I'll, I'd like to give credit to my collaborators, Kyle Finley and Jean Leroux of DFR Lab who assisted um, with the collection of the data and some of the graphs I'll be showing later on in the presentation. And to, to be able to, to establish a link between information that is collected about us online and how we would say that that is being used for surveillance. First, um, from the tweets, we created an interaction map. And from that interaction map, we also have a community cluster where um, users are using an algorithm built into a community of, of like-mindedness. And then we see a general um, map of the conversations that happened around NSAS tweets. Um, now, I'll show later that this is a general conversation, but then the lead figures in the NSAS protest that were later um, sold online, they were bullied online, some of them were arrested, some were even placed on travel ban lists. Most of them appear in this conversation map. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it is, the, the graph is not very big, but I'll make reference to particular names. So this is just to give us an overview of, of the interaction. Um, these are notes of importance because of the degree of mentions that they got uh, from their Twitter conversations as it relates to NSAS. And um, for the social protest, the first thing the government tried to do, which we relate to, to digital surveillance, is to first shadow ban the NSAS hashtag. And that is creating a counter hashtag that tries to um, draw attention away from the NSAS hashtag that was trending at that time. And to, to do that, they got some um, paid influencers to help them manage that. And those are the influencers we see on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, they create the content, they create the post, and then they, once it is shared, the people in the green cluster by the right are the, are the, I call them keyboard armies that are used in retweeting and sharing these posts on Twitter, either by liking, they retweet, they quote, they tweet. But the main guys who, who the government employ to do these things are the guys we refer to as um, online influencers. And a couple of them, their names are shown there. But I'll explain a bit of this graph. Um, this, this figure was generated by John, um, who did a report on how government was using coordinated activity to target um, leaders of the protest last year when just after the NSAS protest. And he's someone I'm collaborating with on my own study on um, digital surveillance. Now from, from this influencer community, I'm, I'm talking about the figure, the, the accounts on the left, you see that um, they are related by, when you look at the information in their, um, about themselves, who they follow and all of that, you see, and you see connection that they are not just individuals that have been picked random. They featured in the data set because of their activities and the kind of um, sentiments that they've expressed in the tweets they shared um, 
on NSAS protest. So this is just to make the other, the left community here more visible so that uh, you see what I'm trying to say. So, um, and then once these influencers um, generate this content, of course they are paid by the government. And when I say they are paid by the government, it is because of a few information that I'm able to collect on these individuals from their profiles, from their tweets online. Um, for instance, you see the first by the top left, the Patriot, you see that he works at the Federal Ministry of Environment. Then the second person, you see there's an information there, he's a Buharist. Um, CBN Gov Akinshola, again, has information, presidential campaign team. Then the other guy is a digital communication expert. All of them have something to, to do with the government by the information that they have provided on their profiles. And aside the tweets, I also conducted a digital ethnography on, on this account by going through their timelines to also see the kind of uh, posts that they make, whether they are pro-government or anti-Buhari and the APC. And if you, if you just Google them, these are publicly available um, data. If you Google them, you'd see what I'm talking about, that they, they, they are always pro-government in their uh, post. And most of them, um, we used um, another software. Most of them follow each other and they try to reinforce or boost the post that they make so that it becomes quite visible. Now, um, in terms of the protest, one of the arguments that government will make is that they are conducting surveillance. Like I said, surveillance is not bad in itself because if you don't, if there's no surveillance by the government, then we'll not be able to check things like cyber crimes uh, for which Nigeria is, is pretty known for, not a good thing. But for us to control such crimes on the internet, we need the government to also take charge of what is happening online. However, for us to decide whether it is care or control, we would see some examples here. Um, from the interaction map, map I showed earlier, one of the, I just picked a few accounts here. One is Eromosele, and we can see that Eromosele was arrested because of his uh, um, participation in the protest. DJ Switch was also looked for. We remember how she was the one that live streamed the Lekki Massacre, and as I speak, she's in Canada on asylum status. Um, uh, Renu is, is there. We, well, we have a couple of them, Dr. Uh, Mr. Macaroni. These individuals featured in the interaction map, and it is no coincidence that the government is picking up um, people who participated in the protest, and they are people that we can find, we can trace their participation to their tweets on NSAS. So the government, it just shows that the government did not randomly pick people. Eromosele wasn't picked on the street. They got his information from Twitter and then, you know, um, in collaboration with um, the internet service providers and the telcos, they are able to get geolocation information of, of these persons and um, get them arrested or, or do some other things. Uh, we, we will also remember that the government had a no-fly list that consisted of uh, majorly um, names from the NSAS protesters, people whom, who featured prominently in the protest. They're placed on a no-travel list. And that's because government was able to get this um, data double information from their online activity. A, 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 a lot of them have been um, they, they've cried out on Twitter complaining about, you see Renu there, I, if you go to her timeline, you see a lot of very negative and angry responses from, from some users whom when you check their profile, you see that they, either they are either Buharis or they are supporters of the APC or something. But the government does not come as a person to look at what you're doing online. They have these keyboard armies online who monitor activities for them and report back to them. This is something that government has borrowed from its attempt to manipulate users 
uh, during elections. Now the government is translating um, the same ideology to managing social protest. And I can assure you, after today's June 12th protest, you would see people being picked up again. When you look at the individuals that are being picked up and their participation online, you'll find a very clear correlation for you to know that um, data is being collected on people from their online participation. Now, as, as a theoretical grounding, um, Panopticon, we are looking at Panopticon here as a metaphor to, to help us understand how digital surveillance is, is being carried out. Uh, the, the original idea of Panopticon is, is um, something that has to do with an architectural design where a prison is designed with a tower at, at the center. The, the, the watchman is able to see all the cells and the prisoners, but the prisoners do not see the watchman. Now, that idea of having an eye on you at every point in time is what we have translated to an online space where government now sits in a tower without you seeing them, but they monitor everything you do online. And I, I'm, I'm sure we must have had one or two instances where you type something online, you want to share a post or react to something. Um, you type it, you delete it. Sometimes you edit because you are worried about if I post this, will the government come after me? If I post this, what will happen? We are conscious of that I, the big brother, who, whom we think is watching us. So we are always very conscious of what we post online because we don't want to get into the bad books of the government. And that's why I found uh, Panopticon as a useful theoretical grounding for the study because it clearly explains how surveillance works, what it does, but then, but then we're looking at it in the context of social media. So we can easily say that um, social media is, is a 21st century panopticon in, in, in this context. Again, um, another argument that, that is pushed forward by the government in, in con carrying out surveillance is the idea of protection, that they are protecting their citizens from um, external influences, from terrorism, extreme speech, hate speech, fake news, misinformation, as you would have it. But then when you look at the activities of government, you see that it is rather a case of prescription and not protection. Here we see a report from Reuters that says um, um, individuals' account, accounts were frozen, there were threats, there were detentions, and there are even um, testimonies from people to say that they were paid to also post online and discredit the NSAS protest, discredit the Lekki massacre. These are actions that come from the state. And if we say that the government is not responsible for, for prescription, or the government is not responsible for freezing the assets of individuals who have direct links with the protest, then my question would be, then who, who is doing all of this? I, I, I recall the government came out and labeled the no-fly list as fake news. But then one of the pro uh, protesters, um, um, her name is Mo, she was placed on a no, no travel list. She went, her passport was even taken from her. And then you say government is not involved in it. Then if, if, she had, if she had not participated in the protest, again, I have checked her profile today and I see that she is again in the forefront of conversations around the June 12th protest. And from, from such activities, the government is collecting information and if they feel they need to clamp down on individuals. They just go to the back end data that they collect and then they, they know exactly who to target and who to leave out of, of their activities. Um, revelations after the NSAS protest have shown that surveillance has vastly increased in both form and content. And then the emergence of social media has made the roles of the watcher and the world and then power related in society um, now we, we we have an emerging case of of um, what I call lateral surveillance because 
we as individuals, um, Masha Makluhan said, the media is an extension of man. We as individuals, we spend a lot of time online. Some people spend virtually their whole day online. And when you do that, you leave digital traces. You, you also leave your um, digital double for government to be able to collect information and know the kind of conversations or the kind of trends that you have. Do that a knowingly or knowingly, because we have about what we are doing. Um, constant the minute update activities is being shared on Twitter, and the government is gracefully there to collect and store when they need to use it. They always uh, fall back on it. So that's um, another revelation from the NSAS protest. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that surveillance practices will continue to be used to actively create digital gates uh, with a view to suppress or coerce members of the public toward some hidden governmental agenda. One thing with uh, digital gates is that it, it is more visible in, in political participation. Digital gates discourage people from participating in deliberative democracy. People don't want to be critical of the government for fear of the big brother not coming after them. People don't want to participate in elections because they feel when you express your views about what is happening, the government is unhappy and then they send their trolls after you. And then digital gates also create social tension. Um, when, we, when we want to look at it in a literal sense, a, a community that has a gate does not allow everybody to come in. And whoever gets into the community is being checked at the gate before the person is permitted to get in. And that is what we are having with um, digital surveillance, that people are aware of being monitored. And because of that awareness, they become very conscious of what they post, and then they are therefore excluded from critical discussions online. A, a, a lot of people would want to be critical of the government in terms of its performance. But as an online user, you get quite cautious because you don't know what you're going to post and um, what is going to happen after. So if uh, I, some of us may have had the experience, you post something negative about a government official and then out of the blues, you find this account who just calm down on you, talking all sorts of things, threatening you just because of what you have posted. Yes, the politician is not there in person, but these people employ um, online influencers. They pay them to do this job. They sit down 247 on the internet, collecting information about people who like and who don't like them. And this information is being shared. So yes, surveillance will continue, but the intentions behind it will always remain sustainable. Thank you. If you, if you have questions, you can just drop them in the comment section. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, we want to ask um, Father Dewan um, to unmute and continue as with the discussion along with uh, Tep Long. Thank you. Hello, Father Dewan, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes. Um, yeah, okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Happy Democracy Day. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, yeah. Um, good evening, Sam. Good evening, sir. Yeah, well, I've had a job trying to connect. Um, it's been pouring out of the heavens, you know, uh, in this part of the world, I uh, had to resort to my uh, phone to, to see if I could uh, connect. 80% um, to 90% of your presentation, I didn't hear, but 
I got the tail end of it. And uh, on the whole, I have a gist of what the presentation is about. And um, it talks on the reality of our situation, not only because we are an emerging democracy, but indeed, uh, I think um, leaders in across Africa seem to be making quite some virtues out of uh, the, the, the leaders, the, the activities in China uh, and other countries of the world that are stifling uh, dissenting voices, especially using online platforms such as Twitter for self-expression. Um, am I surprised? No, I'm not. Um, I think what this implies is that um, users must be resilient um, in, in the effort to make their voices heard. Um, I've been reading lately about um, some of the reasons being advanced for the case of between Twitter and the Nigerian government. And I think it goes beyond just uh, Mr. Pre Mr. President's uh, message being, being deleted from, from, from Twitter, I think it is that uh, increasingly these social media platforms are providing avenues for young people, a large cohort of, uh, of Nigerians to create content and uh, share same with uh, the larger public. So it's this democratization of, of uh, of, of voices, opposing voices, dissenting voices that leaders such as ours, they, they, they dissent and uphold. Up now, um, within the context of mass media law and ethics, yes, every profession is guided and governed by its um, laws and, uh, and ethics. I think the media institution is by no means um, an exception. However, we do have enough laws to check excesses or the abuse of these platforms, I should say. Um, Twitter, Facebook, etc., have removed content that, based on their judgment, based on their guidelines, are inconsistent with. Uh, what should be. So I'm not surprised that the Nigerian government is rather nervous about the continued activities of um, social media giants like Twitter. Over three years ago, um, the spokesperson for the Nigerian government has threatened that users will be sanctioned, will uh, will face all kinds of uh, sanctions. So this has been long coming. And this is just the beginning of uh, perhaps many more things to come, unfortunately. So, but users must be resilient, must be determined uh, in their effort also um, to ensure that other avenues for self-expression are found. Good governance or democracy doesn't come easy. It is a fight between those who are benefiting from the current system and those who want a better Nigeria. Um, the clamp down on Twitter is a metaphor for the kind of uh, leaders that we have who are very much nervous about um, you know, what do not sit well with them. And I have thought that um, agencies or platforms like the social media should, are supposed to be like barometers for gauging, for, uh, for helping governments and its agents to gauge themselves from the vast array of uh, opinions and voices coming out from the different media platforms. But unfortunately, the reading of the situation does not suggest that they, they want critical feedback. Governments around the world, um, especially in the Western world, yes, they focus attention 
on uh, how to prevent certain invasion into the, the sp their own space. But in our own case, um, the voices of of uh, opposition have been stifled. So I think your contribution to this is 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 it's a wake up call of sorts that the digital digital gate, which has been mounted by government and government officials uh, are meant to filter um, all kinds of messages. And when they talk about propaganda and all of those things, they're in effect saying that only those, it only becomes a propaganda if it is um, in opposition to their views. But if it is in their favor, such things are allowed. But if, you know, um, this is the reality of democracy. If you have monitored the pattern of how democracy have evolved, even in Nigeria, beginning from the time of the British, um, they put in place wide ranging and cross cutting media laws that prevent, tended to prevent um, the nationalists and their media from, from opposition. But they remained determined until independence was achieved. And soon after independence, unfortunately, um, that, that um, resoluteness of the media that had been witnessed uh, in pre-independent pre time was unfortunately lost in the quest for regionalism and ethnicity and religion and all of those things. But all those uh, things were being recovered um, from the 1980s, especially in the 1990s, when uh, the government of General Babangida in 1992 decided to uh, allow for the democratization of the media um, so that to the extent that broadcast, me broadcast media were no longer an exclusive reserve or right of government at the federal and state level alone, but even individuals can proudly own this thing. So it is a fight. It is a fight that most we will be prepared to take on. Um, it may take a whole lot of time, but I think we should be able to send a very clear message also by our defiant attitude in the kind of content that we've shown out. So even users themselves have a moral responsibility and ethical you know, consideration also in the kind of uh, content they, they churn, they produce for dissemination in the wider public. So I'd like to congratulate you on this maiden edition on, of our webinar, which is the first in a series of webinars to come. Uh, it is also marking the coming of age of Plateau State University. Uh, as an institution. Um, unfortunately for us, evidence of our being in the third world country, our uh, internet backbones are far from what they should be. Uh, I'm just one out, out of several other colleagues who have been struggling to connect, but there you are. Um, but I'm sure with time, things can only get better. So I'd like to congratulate you for setting the ball rolling on this occasion, and I hope that we'll see more of such intellectual discourse that will hugely enrich our uh, intellectual space, not just in, at Plasto or in Nigeria, but indeed across Africa and the global intellectual community. Thank you. And once again, happy democracy. Thank you. Right. Um, I think we'll take questions now. Thank, thank you so much, Sam, for an amazing research and presentation. And thank you, Father Dewan, for the added insight. So we have questions already. And um, before we go on, please, if you would want to ask a question and you don't want to put it in the chat box, you can just kindly raise your hand. If you look down, you'll see the reaction, reactions icon. There's the raise hand. You could just raise your hand and then I'll call on you to ask your questions. But we'll, I'll read out the questions that have been sent already. Um, Israel was the first person to send um, a question, and that was when you were showing the shadow banning answers hashtag slide. Yeah, so Israel was asking, what do the colors represent in the interaction map? So that was the first question. So I don't know, do I read the questions one after the other? I can see the questions. I, I 
let me just respond to them from the chat section. Thank you. Okay, there are um, some that I have. I don't know. You don't have them there. Okay. I'll, when I'm done with this one, then we can All take right, the fine. questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the colors in the interaction map are used to identify nodes of importance because from the software, we, we check the degree, either in degree or out degree. Out degree are the conversations that come from a user to other users. In degree is the number of conversations that come to the user. So on Twitter, for instance, if, if you make a tweet and then you direct it to, to me, that is an in degree. But then in the, in the graph, we have a combination of in degree and out degree. But mainly we, we try to look at um, the kind of conversations that are directed to a particular user. What did you post and what kind of reactions uh, did it get? So we, we use the colors to differentiate um, users who have higher um, degrees. So we don't get confused because if I show you the raw format of, of the, the graph, everybody is on the same color. But because we need to make emphasis or place emphasis on particular accounts, we now color them so that we can uh, differentiate one user from the other. Then the, the next question is, um, how do we avoid such surveillance? Um, unfortunately, um, we can't avoid it because today's, today's life is an, an internet or technologically driven uh, society. I, I'm, I'm not trying to push for tech determinism, but there are, as academics, for instance, everything we do has to do with technology. Um, the university system, the kind of research we do, and as individuals for social life, the only way you can take yourself out of the view of the government is to never have any mark on the internet. If you create a social media account and then you go back and delete it, I'm sorry, you have left digital traces that can always be used even when you are no longer there. Uh, for instance, I, I can collect um, tweets about an event that happened in 2019 or 2015. So if you have deleted your account, it doesn't mean the government can no longer have access to information about you if they need to. So it's, it's quite difficult for, for you to do that. But one, one way um, is for users to maybe turn off their geolocation information from their accounts. At least you reduce the amount of information that government has access to. And, you know, just tying that into what is currently happening. The use of VPNs will mess up a lot of things. Um, people are tweeting from a location, but then their location is showing a different location. So you, when you have things like that, it becomes a bit difficult for, for the government to use such online trace to look for you, except they want to use information that they're able to get from your local connection. By that, I mean your, your SIM card and the rest that the tel telecoms company can, can provide them with. Because for every phone and, and SIM card that has a GPS connection, they can always trace you if the need arises. Uh, secondly, social media behavior and social data security. How do we balance the two? Um, behavior and data security. People, people, the social media is, is a free space for people to freely expre express themselves, even though there are rules, like um, Father Dewan had said, if you violate the rules of a platform, the platform has a right to take actions against you. You don't decide what the platform does. The platform gives you, a lot of times we don't read um, the terms and conditions. We just click accept because we want to get on the platform. Although there is, the, there is the other side for saying that the platforms force you to accept the conditions because where you decline, they don't allow you to open the account. So there is control 
from the tech companies forcing you to accept certain ter terms and conditions. But when you do that, then you are bound by their conditions on how they want people to express themselves. But um, you cannot, it's difficult to balance the two, except you want to always be on the lookout and not post things that will offend the government. And when you do that, we want to ask, how fair are you in terms of um, being critical of governance or issues that are in, in, in public space? Except you want to pretend or you want to monetize your online presence as most uh, um, influencers do in Nigeria. Once you pay them, they dance to whatever tune the government wants them or politicians want them to, 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 to respond to. Uh, does the number of tweets attract attention or what? Um, it depends on what you're tweeting about. If, if I go back to that interaction map, um, it's a yes and a no. DJ Switch, for instance, was not visible. She was not prominent in the interaction map. And that's because she only came into the conversation on the day of the Lekki massacre. So you will see that she's there, but she's not as prominent as the others. Um, the, the, the likes of Aisha, Yusufu, Savi, Rin, uh, Rinu, and the rest were already tweeting about this protest even before it became um, a trending issue. So the number of tweets must align with what is trending. So if you tweet a lot, you may go on Twitter today and post a lot of things and not use the hashtag. In that case, your, your participation may not be picked up as prominent as others who used the hashtag or certain phrases that have to do with what is being discussed. So your, the number of tweets, yes, can attract attention, but it depends on the content of the, the tweets. Um, I, I, hope, I hope I've answered your question. Uh, then the government does not appreciate opposable minds. Yes, um, like, like Father said, we already have laws um, that address regulating online behavior. For, for instance, Section 24 of the Cybercrime Act addresses a lot of the things that government is pretending to want to to, to use as a reason to regulate social media. Again, section four or five of the Terrorism Act also addresses issues of cyber, all these things, we already have existing laws and that was why people kicked against the social media bill when it came up because there are laws on ground existing that address this issue. So why do you want to make double laws for the same uh, purpose? Um, are the peculiarities to this? Are there peculiarities to this phenomenon of surveillance in terms of global regions? Uh, there are no peculiarities. We in 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 Africa, we most times like to take examples from from the global north, and this idea of surveillance is something that we borrowed from the global north. Uh, um, when, when we take our minds back to the Cambridge Analytica issue, it was tested somewhere before they brought it to Nigeria. And then when they tried it in Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, it, we packaged it and then took it back to the US to use for the 2016 presidential election, which made the issue of online uh, social media manipulation very prominent. So it, it's not peculiar because every government in the world is not friendly with um, criticism. They, they want passive um, followership and that is not possible when it comes to democracy. The only places where you can, you can talk about such passivity is in China, Iran, and, and uh, either communist um, societies or places where you have a full dictatorship. But in Africa, most of what we do there are ideas that we borrow from the global north. Um, can there be supranational policies that aid people in eschewing? Ah, we, we, we can't run away from, from surveillance. As long as you use the internet, 
your information will always be freely available to these people. Except the only thing we can do is to manage the amount of information that we freely make available to them. I, I, I did talk about lateral surveillance. Um, our use of spaces like um, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, we are always eager to contribute to issues, always eager to provide updates on what we are doing. All, all these activities are providing free information to either the government or corporations who commodify this data and sell to interested parties, particularly when it comes to elections. And we are seeing the same trend being taken into social protest. There's a protest that the government begins to interpret the protest from a political angle. Um, I recall just recently the president said um, the entire protest was, was to remove him from office. You know? That's the kind of politicization of social protest that I, I was trying to talk about. Um, I think you can look into the direction of Okushian approach to Panopticon. Yes, um, the, the, my use of Panopticon as, as a metaphor is first, um, when, you, when you look at um, how Jeremy Bentham theorized it, and then Pakot also tried to expand on it. But um, I, I was trying to pick on the aspect of the awareness that we have today where the watched is aware of being watched by somebody, which, which is something the digital space um, provides us. But thank you for, for the suggestion. I'll, I'll take that into consideration. I, I forgot to mention at the beginning that the research is still work in progress. And that's why um, I have not presented it in the manner of having results because we're we are not done with the analysis of, of our data. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Abe. Um, government will always target key actors in every mobilization. It does have to be determined by focus to earn through expression. Well, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, UPM will affect the authenticity of data. Definitely. UPM messes up data when you have to do an analysis and your focus is on geolocation, then you can't tell who tweeted from where. And that, that becomes a big problem for researchers. I think it's in particular context. Okay. Um, any exception? Can we see all digital surveillance practices by God? No, no. Um, digital surveillance is not bad in its entirety. And I think I, I said that at the beginning of my presentation that it is good if you don't have the government watching the cyberspace, then you have people, all sorts of online scams going on. Um, today, we extreme online speech is a big problem where people go online to make others look bad. Um, we have people who scam others online and all sorts of things happen. If the government does not watch the cyberspace, then it is unable to protect its citizens against things like that. So it's not entirely bad. But what I made reference to at, at the uh, beginning is that when surveillance is now narrowed to individuals or groups with political intentions, then it becomes of concern. We, we can no longer say that this is protection. We can't say that the government is caring for its citizen. And that, that was why I, I, I tried to bring up a binary that um, could it be protection or prescription? If, if you are protecting people, then you don't go about arresting illegally individuals or threatening people with um, online trolls. So we, we, we can't say that digital surveillance is, is entirely bad. The government needs to also monitor its territory, protect its own sovereignty. So it is, it is good, but we are seeing malicious um, appropriation of digital surveillance in today's society where governments have become very sick when it comes to criticism, uh, open criticism on, on social media. 
Okay, I, I think I, those are the questions. Yes. Yeah, there's a raise of hand here, but there's no name. Um, the person has Galaxy S20 Ultra G. Please, if that's you, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hello, Sam. Hi, Dr. Williams. Okay, um, let me just go straight to my question. Um, digital surveillance undergoes uh, changes. As a historian, I'm always very curious about uh, transformations and um, uh, continuities. So my question is, um, what, how can you um, explain, is there, has there been any change in terms of government surveillance of the uh, bring back our girls? Uh, this hashtag is nothing new. Um, bring back our girls versus this NSTAS. Have you, have you noted any um, transformation, any change is it the same thing that I think I, I, I'll be interested to know? Okay, thank you. Um, first, historically, is that we have moved from a traditional system of surveillance where government deploys uh, the police and state security agents to go after whoever they, they are interested in to the use of digital technology. But in the case of Bring Back Our Girls, yes, it was also a social media driven activism. But in that case, we, we had um, identifiable leaders of the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, which is a sharp contrast uh, to what we experienced with NSAS. It was a leaderless protest. So it was difficult for government to pick up um, Mr. Macaroni, for instance, because Mr. Macaroni did not identify himself as the leader of the protest. Um, Aisha Yesufu and Obi Yezekesi, these are people up to today who still front as leaders of the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. So um, in, in the usage of digital surveillance, the government is cautious of not operating in a way that makes it um, visible that this is what the government is trying to do. So, you can understand why Aisha Yesufu or Obiese Kwesi were not, um, was, neither of them was arrested or locked up because it becomes very obvious that it is the state that is after them. But in the case of um, NSAS, the government had to use digital footprints to say, okay, you were the one that promoted this hashtag on Twitter. And for that reason, we feel you are a threat to national security and then we pick up the person. That for me is the difference I find in the two protests. One had identifiable leadership. The other was an open leadership. Everybody was considered a leader of the protest as long as you're involved in it. And you know, it puts the government in a difficult situation. And that was why you see they had to go make a travel ban list because they needed to keep setting individuals within the country for not being sure of what they may do when they go outside the country. And we can see what is happening with um, DJ Switch, for instance. Her job has been taken. She doesn't even have access to her finances and all of that. If not for the asylum status she got in, in Canada, I doubt, I, don't, I really don't know what would have happened to her. And I'm sure if government has access to to DJ Switch, they, they won't give her a um, nice meal on the table. Okay. Um, thank you, Sam. We've exceeded our time, but I think we can take one last question. So there's someone who wants to ask a question. Nanchin, please, can you unmute yourself? And after that, Dr. Nadi, please, can you take over and give us, give us a wrap up? Uh, hello, this is Dr. Nancy from Department of Mass Communication. And uh, I just want to kind of add to the conversation, uh, especially with the question about peculiarities about this in different regions in the world. I wanted to note that the United States of America, for example, has a social media surveillance and vetting program being run by the Department of Homeland Security. And I think for them, the reason for incorporating social media monitoring into its immigration custom and border enforcement activities, according to them, is for security reasons. But gradually, we've also began to see that uh, that in its own, it's been um, 
investigated by the Senate uh, in the US because they are reportedly using these kind of programs to surveil groups like the Black Lives Matter and other individuals then, for example, who are involved in any protests against Trump in New York City, lawyers, journalists, and all that. So one fascinating thing about the US situation is it is a policy that is on ground to actually conduct this surveillance. And um, even though it is supposed to deal with security issues gradually, we're seeing like every other thing, there is um, kind of an extreme vetting that is moving to the other side of trying to suppress as free speech. Uh, part of, I think for me, part of the reason why there's a distrust for it, if you remember during the 2016 elections in the US, Cambridge Analytica actually bought the data of Facebook users around the world and sold it to a lot of uh, political groups. So that is kind of, uh, for me, the downside. So on one side, one could say that it has its benefits in terms of protecting the security of the nation. But on the other side, like every other thing, Surveillance is going on among US citizens and it's uh, causing a lot of problems. And that question about what can we do to, you know, avoid the surveillance, uh, like Sam said, it may not necessarily be a very easy thing to do. But over time, I've come to understand that using a virtual private network, the VPN, is kind of one of the most effective privacy tools available. And so with the VPN, you're able to browse anonymously using a virtual IP network. And that will protect you against IP tracking and your internet service provider will also find it difficult to track you. Also pay attention to things like the malware uh, on your, you know, when you have a lot of malware, you, you, you have some, they call them some antivirus blogs and all that. A lot of times, some of them are discovered to be used by intelligence agencies around the world. So, you know, maybe one thing we should do is continue to keep our computers up to date and malware free because when we allow a lot of malware on our computer, some of these malwares are just for tracking and surveillance. And uh, maybe we should also keep low profiles, especially if you're working as an activist and all that, both an online and an offline uh, profile can be moderated so that you're not easily picked up. And then, you know, you begin to go through some of the harassments of government. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that very brilliant uh, contribution. That's, that's something we, we, I think if we have a policy statement uh, from the government that addresses surveillance, then it, it will be helpful. Uh, again, um, on, on the positives of, of digital surveillance, we see from the capital protest that happened uh, in uh, 2020, yeah, 2020 election in the, in the US. It, it, it was very easy for the government to identify who participated in that uh, capital protest because they had their data from the central surveillance system and they could just pick up anybody they wanted from the person's participation. And in that instance, it was for good. But um, in, in, in Africa, we see very well that uh, power is, is a very difficult thing to handle. Once people get into power, then they, they start thinking of themselves as, as demigod. But I'm, I'm sure things like, like um, Dr. Nancy said, things, things can, can get better. Um, then lastly, with the VPN, sometimes it's difficult when you are using a VPN for, for you to do some transactions online because the inability of the provider to ask a certain your location, they flag you as a suspicious subscriber. Um, for, for, for instance, the banks here, if you use VPN, you won't be able to use your bank app, to, either your bank app or your banking information to do any online transaction because they can't ascertain your location at that point in time. And it's for the protection of their Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to call on um, Dr. Barrera to round up. But when we're talking about malware, uh, I used to tell Dr. Francis, um, bias towards Apple. I think Apple saves you a lot of that problem. Thank you. So, but Dr. Barrera, please. Um, thank you, um, Sam, for starting the conversation. I hope that this conversation will 
uh, go on. I want to thank colleagues for uh, making time from the very busy schedule. I just hope that we can just learn to support each other because um, if you come out to have a presentation and you only have two people, I'm sure it will not be very nice. So we must learn to be very collegial, to create a very supportive community. Let's support each other's um, research. So please, I will um, appeal to everyone that we should try. This is just the beginning. And if you're going to have any meaningful uh, contribution to your research, you must have it in this kind of um, forum, in conversations where people will add value to your research. And you yourself, in talking, you begin to see various perspectives and dimensions. So I thank you once again for uh, making it a very interesting time. I think it was worth it. Um, we are going to be having this continuously. Um, I, my research, I'm going to be presenting um, next. I will be so talking about markets, identity, and political conflicts on the Just Plateau um, next month. I will also suggest, suggest that if we have more people, so as to utilize um, the Zoom payment, we can have it you know, twice in a month. Um, depending on the kind of traffic we have. So just uh, let us know in the research office if you uh, you have a research you want to talk about and we can then create uh, time for you. So I thank you uh, all. I hope that we, can, we will see you also. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Happy Democracy Day, whatever that means. Okay, thank you everyone. I uh, will end the meeting now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you.